Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Moore Cronin, and today we're discussing the future of real estate. That means we'll get into why the Federal Reserve just sounded the alarm on commercial real estate, why the residential real estate market continues to boom despite the pandemic, and how technology, human behavior, and global financial trends are changing the dynamics of real estate in 2021 and beyond. Let's start with the Federal Reserve's recent warning about the commercial real estate sector. So the Fed put out a report warning that, quote, business leverage now stands near historic highs, commercial real estate prices appear susceptible to sharp declines, and insolvency risks remain considerable for small, medium, and for some large firms. So why is business leverage near historic highs right now in commercial real estate? Well, the number one reason is that there are historically low interest rates. So if you can borrow money at 2%, 2.75% interest rate, and then buy properties that appreciate faster than that interest rate, let's say they appreciate at 3% or 5% a year, then that's a great deal for businesses. But interest rates can't stay near zero forever. So eventually interest rates will go up. And that could create a situation where the whole house of cards come crashing down, similar to what happened in the 2008 crisis. So the next question is, why is commercial real estate susceptible to sharp declines in the coming months? Well, one reason is that people aren't working in the office as much as they used to. People are now working from home and even businesses that are starting to open up and have employees in their offices they're oftentimes switching to a hybrid model where maybe they'll only spend a couple days in the office, a couple days at home. And so the demand for office space and brick and mortar storefront space is much lower than it has been in the past. And it's not clear that the trend will return to what happened pre-pandemic. It may be the case that everything moves online and there may not be as much of a need for physical office spaces and physical stores as they're used to. The other factor is that a lot of a lot of businesses are just closing businesses if they can't keep up think about all the stores you see in old strip malls where hardly anyone goes in there one example of this is restaurants closing and then cloud kitchens opening up like mr beast opened up all of these virtual cloud kitchens that cook burgers and deliver them to you. So there's not really a reason to have a super expensive burger shop right on the corner of Main Street. That no longer is as wise of an investment as it used to be. The final reason is that there's been a lot of government support for businesses. So think of PPP loans, think of stimulus checks, and these have allowed some commercial real estate firms to limp along and continue to survive, but for how much longer can they limp along and continue to survive? So as far as taking all of this into consideration, what's gonna happen with commercial real estate? It seems pretty clear that prices will continue to drop for offices, for hotels, for storefronts, because vacancy rates are almost 2x what they typically are. And I'm not convinced that the vacancy rates will go down that much even after people are vaccinated. There are, however, some types of commercial real estate that are doing really well right now, particularly warehouses and distribution centers that actually benefit from this switch to everything being online and everyone wanting no contact delivery and no contact pickup. And interestingly, the story with residential real estate is sort of the reverse of what's going on with commercial real estate. As all of these offices and storefronts are closing, people are desiring homes where they can work from home, where maybe they have a backyard, a balcony, a front yard, they've got some open space. These are the most desirable places now. So even more so than apartment buildings, real single family homes, multifamily units, these are what's really hot right now in the residential real estate market. And that seems like a trend that will continue at least for some time. So with that being said, is it a good idea to buy a home right now? Well, let's look at the history of home prices briefly to consider that question. Up until the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis, house prices pretty much always went up. But in 2008, the median price of a home dropped from 275K to 175K in 2012. Since 2012, prices have been increasing. And now they're even higher than what they were 
pre-2008 crisis. So a lot of people are asking, are we in another housing bubble in 2021? Well, I wouldn't be so quick to agree that we are in another housing bubble because there are some different dynamics in 2021 than what we had in 2007. In 2007, it was mostly due to speculation that caused the bubble. Everyone wanted a piece of the appreciation. So people are overextended. They're buying homes they can't afford. The banks are approving home mortgages that they probably shouldn't be approving. Whereas in 2021, it feels like people are buying homes as a hedge against possible inflation. So people are flocking to real assets like homes, like farmland, like gold and silver and Bitcoin, because people are worried about the dollar being devalued. They're worried about runaway inflation and the great financial reset, which we talked about last episode. And when we look at the data, this is precisely what we see. We see that all of the new homes that have been bought in 2020, most of them were bought by people with the highest tier of credit scores. So this means that people that are already very well off, they probably already have some real estate, people who are in the 1%, these, this is the vast majority of home buyers since 2020. It's important to recognize that this is part of the larger trend of many assets growing in value when compared to the dollar, right? Because all assets are denominated in dollars right now. And so it's easy to assume that real estate has been going way up. There's probably a bubble. I'm probably better off holding my money in the bank rather than putting it into real estate. But it may be that it's the dollar that's going down and real estate may be more stable. Just like how if you denominate real estate or the stock market in Bitcoin, They've been really stable and maybe even gone down in value. If you denominate it in dollars, then yeah, it'll seem inflated because the dollar is essentially being devalued very rapidly. And I used to think that this would take a few more years for the dollar to really get hit hard and go close to zero. But what I'm seeing now is that it's actually happening a lot quicker than even I had anticipated. And I wouldn't be surprised if the great financial reset happens this year in 2021. And this gets to a really important topic, which is inequality, which is perhaps the most important topic for our entire lifetime that we're going to have to face. And with real estate, more fortunes have been made than with any other type of enterprise. And what tends to happen is that families who own real estate, they keep it within the family, they pass it down through generations, their kids become the next landlords, maybe they grow their real estate holdings, and it becomes harder and harder for people who never owned real estate to break into this market. And we see this reflected in society, where on social media, people are always ripping on landlords. They're saying being a landlord isn't a real job, and any chance they get, people will knock landlords as being somehow evil, bad for the world. And I totally get it. it. It makes sense from a renter's perspective to look at things that way. But we're never going to solve inequality by just allowing a small subset of people to own all the real estate and not actually trying to break into real estate yourself and own some piece of real estate if you're one of the families that has never owned any or if you want to start building a new dynasty for yourself and your offspring. And when we see the generational divide, it's pretty stark. Less than half of millennials by age 30 or 35 own a home, whereas right now almost 80% of baby boomers own a home. And even when baby boomers were age 30 or 35, they owned homes at a much higher rate than millennials do. So there's a generational aspect to this. And if you're looking to get started with owning some real estate, one of the best strategies I've seen is the strategy called house hacking where if you buy a duplex, for instance, you can live in the duplex yourself in one of the units and then in the other unit you rent it out. And as long as you make enough rent that it covers your rent, then you can essentially live for free while you're growing your total net worth as the value appreciates and as you pay off more and more of the mortgage so that you own more and more equity over time. And this gets to the single most important aspect of real estate investing, which is having positive cash flow. So most people, when they think of buying a home, they think, okay, I'm going to put this down payment. I'm going to pay my mortgage each month. 
and then eventually I'll own this home and then I can sell it. If you do that, you're really treating real estate as a liability because every month you have to take money out of your pocket and put it into this asset. So it becomes something that drains your money over time. Yes, you will have some payday someday, but it's also risky because maybe the value will go down like it did after 2008. Maybe it won't appreciate as much as you thought, or maybe you'll have to pay for some big expense before you actually can realize those returns. And because all your money's been tied up, you might have to take out some money against your mortgage. So it is risky to own real estate that has negative cash flow. Luckily, there are ways that you can buy a home, buy a multifamily home, buy a rental property, buy a self storage unit, buy any type of real estate investment and set it up in such a way that the income you get from rent is more than the mortgage you pay. And as long as you get this right and you are able to rent it for more than the cost of the mortgage and the other variable expenses you have, then you get to enjoy all of these other benefits. You can do what's called a 1031 exchange, where so long as you're buying another property, you can defer the capital gains taxes on the property you're selling until you eventually sell that next property. And you can do this over and over again. So as long as you're buying more and more properties, you really never have to pay the capital gains taxes until you make that final sale. But none of these tax benefits would be advantageous enough on their own. It's really so important to have positive cash flow if you're doing it from an investment standpoint. If you're just doing it because you wanna live in a home, you wanna have the security to never get kicked out, that's totally fine. You just need to be aware that that's what your strategy is and that's what you're signing up for. Because 44% of people who bought homes last year regretted buying the home. And usually that's because they didn't factor in all of the expenses they were gonna have to pay to keep up the home, all of the property taxes they're gonna have to pay on that home. So you don't wanna fall into that situation. Now let's get into the future scenarios. Let's talk about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that mass evictions take place as soon as the eviction ban is lifted. Already, 20% of renters in the United States are behind on rent. So some amount of those people will be evicted. Some of them may not be evicted if they're able to get into a better financial situation, but it seems pretty clear that in the worst case, many of these people would be evicted. That would lead to mass homelessness. I've already noticed an uptick in homelessness in LA and in San Francisco, and this could lead to a similar situation to what we're seeing in San Francisco right now, where there's been a 360% increase in crime from 2019 to 2020. And it's almost become a situation where people don't feel safe living in San Francisco. So people are leaving the city, they're going elsewhere, and that's taking tax dollars out of the city. So they have less resources to spend to help people that are in trouble. And this can create a sort of a downward spiral, similar to what happened in Gotham City in the Batman universe, where times are tough, it starts to get scary to live in the city because there's more crime, there's more homelessness, there's more drug use. And so wealthy people leave and then there's less resources to help. So more wealthy people leave and it becomes this downward spiral. And we've already seen this trend of people leaving urban centers to suburban areas or to gated communities. And I'm a little bit worried that we could see a mass exacerbation of inequality such that cities in the U.S. could become more like Abu Dhabi in the UAE, where you have these fancy sports cars, these amazing five-star hotels, these Michelin star restaurants in this very small, high-end part of the city. But then the vast majority of the city are these urban slums and people who hardly have enough food, hardly have enough medical care. So I'm really worried that in the worst case scenario, we're going to see rampant inequality uptick in crime, uptick in homelessness and drug use. And because people are fleeing to places that don't have as bad of conditions, 
we could see an inability in us to pay for the services that we need to. So this is not something that needs to happen. There's certainly enough wealth, definitely in the United States and in other countries, to take care of people who are in hard times. But the trend that's going on right now is a trend of ever-increasing inequality. Now let's get into the best case scenario. Best case scenario. The best case scenario is that we avoid a massive eviction crisis by helping people out. So if we are able to provide enough support for people so that they're able to at least get vaccinated, at least find another job, at least get a little bit more financial security, then we might be able to avoid a really bad crisis. And it seems unlikely that we'd be able to help everyone from being evicted because the numbers are pretty big right now. But we might be able to help half of the people to get vaccinated, get a new job, find some financial security, and therefore we could avoid the downward spiral that we describe in the worst case scenario. The other major way that we can improve the system is through disintermediation. There have been all of these gatekeepers in real estate that have made it really hard to break into the industry if you're not someone who already grew up with parents who owned real estate or if you didn't already go into that profession for your career. And one of the biggest ways is by getting rid of real estate agents, getting rid of all of these middlemen that broker real estate transactions. And it's similar to how the car industry is changing where it used to be that you had to go to a car dealership and talk to a car salesman and you had to really put a lot of mental energy into figuring out if this guy is screwing you over or if you're actually getting a good deal on this car. Now think about buying a car from Tesla. You can buy it online. There's no funny business, no fine print. They deliver it right to you. This is what it will be like to buy a home in the future. It's also similar to what's going on with the travel industry. You used to actually hire travel agents to find the best flight for you, the best hotel. Now you can just go to Expedia or Airbnb or Kayak or any number of sites and quickly find the best price at the best time and the best location. There's no need to hire a travel agent. So I really believe that every aspect of finding a home or any sort of real estate property, buying that property, closing it, doing maintenance on it, collecting rent, refinancing, every aspect of real estate will go online. And the great thing is that that seriously advantages millennials and Gen Zers, people who are really savvy with online transactions. It's kind of like how baby boomers had financial advisors and they'd pay all this money to financial advisors and they'd hardly get any return. Whereas nowadays, most millennials and Zoomers are managing their own finances. They have their Robinhood app, they have Coinbase, they're managing their own money and growing their investment without having to pay these commissions. That's what's gonna to happen to real estate. And I hope and my belief is that this will ease some of the inequality in the real estate sector. The last thing I'll say for the best case scenario is that we are about to experience one of the biggest wealth transfers in history once the great financial reset takes hold. And people who play their cards right by not having so much money in cash and instead putting it into assets like Bitcoin, gold, silver, real estate, real assets that have real value, these people are going to be much better off than people who have done the historically safe thing of keeping a lot of their money in cash, in bonds, in the bank. And I think this does favor younger people who are a little bit bolder. They have a little bit more of a forward looking sense of what's going to happen in the future. And so in the best case scenario, this great financial reset does level the playing field across all asset classes, including real estate. Now let's bring it home with the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. The most likely scenario in my mind is that commercial real estate will continue to go down or at least stagnate in value in the coming year as vacancies remain high and people become more normalized to working from home, remote work and ordering everything online. Of course, the one exception to that is 
commercial real estate that serves online commerce, so warehouses and distribution centers. Residential real estate will continue to grow in value through 2021, particularly anywhere that has backyards, some nice outdoor space in a good location, good natural environment surrounding it. And I actually believe that residential real estate prices in value will continue to go up until we've fully realized the great financial reset. And I think what's going to happen over the next six months is that we're going to see stocks go through the roof. We're going to see gold go through the roof, silver go through the roof. Bitcoin already is starting to go through the roof and everyone's going to worry about asset bubbles. And some people will realize that the real bubble is the dollar. And these assets are more like safe havens for places to put your money before it becomes worthless. And so if I, I would say that if you're thinking about buying a home, it's good to buy a home now if you have a lot of extra liquidity and a lot of extra money you want to put somewhere that's a safe asset. If you don't have a ton of liquidity, I think you're probably better off putting some money into more passive streams like gold, silver, Bitcoin, because you won't have to manage it. You don't have to spend as much time. And you're honestly are probably going to get a better return on those asset classes than you would on real estate. But if you have the money, if you have a lot of money in the bank, I definitely think you're, you'd be better off putting money into real estate than leaving it in the bank. And one thing is for sure, and that's that people will always need a home. People will always need a place to stay. And they're not building any more beachfront locations or beautiful canyon view locations. So real estate is one of the surest bets you can make as long as you have a long-term time horizon you recognize that there is some risk that prices may go down. And there's particular risk now where we are on the precipice of this great financial reset. So if you are a very cautious person, you might want to wait until after that reset to get into real estate. Whereas if you have the risk of just having so much money in cash, might be a good time to take advantage of 0% interest rates and put some of that cash into real estate where it will have a better store of value over time. Well, thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. And I'll see you next week. The past, the present, and the